Okay, good evening everyone. Welcome to the Township of West Lincoln Planning, Building, Environmental Committee meeting. This is meeting number two, Monday, February 10th. And a note to members of the public that all cell phones, pagers, and or PDAs should be turned off. Additionally, for your information, please be advised that we are audio video recording this meeting. My name is Cheryl Ganan, and I'll be chairing this meeting this evening. Um, Councillor Trombetta is away this evening due to illness and sends his regrets. So first of all, to members of committee, are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest and or conflict of interest? Okay, and seeing none, we have three public meetings this evening. The first one is a public meeting um, which, to deal with an amendment to building fees bylaw. So we're going to start with that. This public meeting is being held to meet the requirements of the Ontario Building Code, Act S.O. 1992-23 as amended, sorry. <clears throat> it is the township's intent to introduce costs for pr processing an application for a building permit, specifically with respect to septic permits under Part 8 of the Ontario Building Code Act. Section 7.6b of the Ontario Building Code Act 1992 requires that before passing a bylaw, regulation, or resolution, Council must hold a public meeting at which any person who attends has an opportunity to make representations with respect to proposed changes to the Municipal Building Bylaw. In accordance with Section 7, Subsection 6A of the Building Code Act 1992, public notice of this meeting was given through advert advertisement sorry, in the January 23rd, 2020 edition of the Niagara This Week slash Grimsby Lincoln News. Will the Director of Planning and Building, Mr. Brian Treble, please review report number PD-005-20 regarding an amendment to the building fees bylaw. Mr. Treble. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this application is um, required in order to comply with the uh, building code. Uh, the building code act requires that the concept of uh, the building department uh, should function entirely on its own as uh, an independent unit and, and be self-sufficient from a financial point of view. And there are changes to the cost of delivering the septic function that uh, staff uh, advise must be carried on or passed on to the applicants for new septic systems. So this only applies to the users of the, of the process, those that will benefit from new systems. Uh, you will see from attachment two at page five of the report, PD 29-20, uh, which is page 549 of the agenda, that each of the different types of septic, septic applications are increasing um, by somewhere in the range of 50 to $100 for the service. So a new application for a new septic system, a class uh, four system, or replacement of an existing system, the fee is going from $800 to $900. If it is a tertiary system that requires an annual maintenance inspection, there's an additional $200 fee for those tertiary systems. If it's a minor septic repair or minor septic replacement, the fee goes from 425 to 450. Um, a class five system, which is a holding tank, the fee goes from 350 to 400, et cetera. That's all spelled out in the, in the draft of the bylaw, Madam Chair, that's found at attachment two. So as I mentioned, the cost of the delivery of the septic permitting function is going to increase in 2020. And in addition to that, uh, the township lost somewhere around $6,000 in that component of the delivery last year. So this is meant to offset the increased cost as well as the loss that has occurred in that department. And since this is meant to be self-sufficient, that loss has to, be, uh, has to be recouped through the permitting process. So the proposal before us tonight, Madam Chair, is to consider these changes um, if supported and approved by Council. The plan is to have them in effect as of March the 1st, which is the timing of the, of the increase in the cost of delivery to the township as well. Okay, thank you, Mr. Treble. <clears throat> Are there any oral or written submissions from any members of the public regarding the proposed amendment to the building fees bylaw, specifically with respect to septic permits? So I know we have a number of people in the gallery. Is there anyone who wishes to speak to this? Okay, seeing none. Are there any members of committee who have oral or written submissions? Councillor Rayner. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you to the uh, Director of Planning, Brian Treble. Um, how are these calculations done, Mr. Treble, to determine that the costs of going to go through the permit process is actually costing the township more than, than anticipated? Through you, Madam Chair, initially, uh, and, and I think I'm going back to about 2012 or thereabouts, uh, we had hired a consultant, uh, BMA Consulting, which actually sat down and worked through all of the different steps in the issuance of a, actually a planning process as well as a building process, and they determined sort of the cost and the, and the length of time it took of various different staff to process an application and then calculated a factor at that point and recommended actually that it should increase by the cost of living each year. We have not been doing that because building is a little different and it's supposed to be self-sufficient. Um, so I guess my point would be I think we're starting from a reasonably solid base in terms of how the number was established and I've simply elevated it based on what I believe to be uh, an appropriate cost or an appropriate uh, inflation uh, level to cover cost. We'll have to revisit it at the end of the year to see whether or not we were successful. But the, but the base number should be reasonably accurate. Thank you, Mr. Treble. Anything further, Councillor? No, that's all. Thanks. Okay. Any further questions or comments? Okay. Seeing none, there is an attendance sign list by the door, which we would ask all present to sign if they wish to be notified of Council's decision with respect to amendments to the building fees bylaw, specifically with respect to septic permits. This public meeting with respect to amendments to the building fees bylaw is adjourned at the hour of 6.36. Okay, the second public meeting uh, this evening is a meeting under the Planning Act. It's 4.1 on your agenda. Oh, checking some, some misplaced signs. This is a public meeting to consider a zoning bylaw amendment application submitted by zoning bylaw amendment Kellett and Henderson, 27 Lass Road, and Merritt, 29 Lass Road, and Peter Budd Agent. The Planning Act requires in Section 34, Subsection 12, that before passing a zoning bylaw amendment, Council must hold at least one public meeting for the purpose of informing the public in respect of this amendment. The purpose of this public meeting is to receive comments and answer questions from the public regarding the amendment to the Township of West Lincoln Zoning Bylaw. We stress that at this point no decision has been made on the proposed amendment and any comments received will be taken into account by Council in their consideration. The Planning Act requires through Section 34, Subsection 13 that Council advise the public that if a person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions to the Township of West Lincoln before the bylaw is passed, the person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision of Council for the Township of West Lincoln to the Local Planning Appeal Tribunal or LPAP. Would the Deputy Clerk please advise of the method and dates by which notice of the public meeting was given? Proper notice was given by way of public notice sent out on December 20th, 2019. <coughs> Additionally, a yellow sign was posted on the subject property and notice was provided on the township's website and in the lobby of the township's administrative building. Okay, thank you. Will Planner 1, Alexa Cooper, please explain the purpose and reason for the proposed zoning bylaw amendment. Ms. Thank Cooper. you, Madam Chair. Uh, Elsa, if you wouldn't just mind putting the sketch up. Thank you. A rezoning application has been submitted for a portion of 27 and 29 Last Road. This rezoning is required as a condition of two minor boundary adjustment applications. These applications were conditionally approved by the Township's Committee of Adjustment in October of 2019. The lands to be rezoned are marked as Parts 2 and Part 4 on the sketch. So that's these two parts at the back of the properties. Uh, these parts are currently zoned residential low density, type 1C or R1C. The application proposes to rezone them to an open space recreation zone or an OSR with no site specific exceptions. The intent of the minor boundary adjustment and the subsequent rezoning application are to help with the proposed stormwater management plan on the neighboring property to the west. So that's this piece here. Parts two and four are to be severed and merged with the property to the west. Neither the provincial policy statement, a place to grow plan, the Niagara region's official plan, the minor boundary adjustments within the urban boundary of Smithville, 
They do, however, contain certain policies that speak to promoting efficient development and land use patterns and optimizing existing infrastructure in a way that is the most cost effective. Um, township staff have noted that the two sheds uh, on the property here don't currently meet zoning regulations, but they are to be moved before uh, the final certificate is given for their minor boundary adjustment application. So they will be moved to comply with zoning. The township's departments have no objection to the application as proposed. In the Niagara region and the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority were not required to be circulated this application. No public comments have been received from the public to date, and township planning staff will bring forth a recommendation report to this committee following the input received through tonight's public meeting process. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So is the applicant here and is, don't know, or Mr. Budd? Okay, do you wish to speak to it any further, or is that, was that sufficiently explained for you? Okay, thank you. Okay, are there any oral or written submissions from anyone present regarding the proposed zoning bylaw amendment? I would like to stress that this may be the only public meeting held with respect to this application. Therefore, if any members of the public would like to make comments and or provide written comments, they should state them. Any other council and or committee meeting. Also, anyone wishing to speak is required to come forward to the microphone at the table and provide their name and address for the record prior to speaking. So... Nothing further then. I'm going to move on. Do any members of committee have any oral or written submissions on the proposed zoning bylaw amendment? Please note that members of the committee must make their comments now as the LPAP may not consider comments made during a planning building environmental meeting or, and or any other council or committee meeting. So members of committee, okay. please be advised that a technical report is being considered by committee this evening and that a recommendation report will be forthcoming to a future committee and or council meeting. Please be advised that once the planning committee and or council has made a decision with respect to the zoning bylaw amendment, and if approved by council, a notice of its passing will be circulated with an appeal period. There's an attendance sign-in sheet which is located on the table near the exit doors, which we would ask all present to sign. Please ensure that when signing the attendance sheet for this evening's committee meeting that you place a check mark in the column marked bud if you wish to be advised of any subsequent meetings and or decisions in this matter. Therefore, people who are interested in observing council and or committee discussions about a particular bylaw should not solely rely on mailed notices and thus miss the opportunity to attend the meetings. It is suggested that you watch the township's website for posting of agendas to review items that will be discussed at a council and or committee meeting. The agendas for meetings are posted on the township website at 4 p.m. on the Friday prior to the meeting. Additionally, meeting schedules are also noted on the website for the public to view. If you wish to receive notices by email, it is suggested that you include your email address with your mailing address and your phone number on the attendance sign-up sheet. So this public meeting with respect to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment is concluded at the hour of 6.42. So our third and final public meeting this evening is a public meeting to consider a zoning bylaw amendment application submitted by Silverdale Sports Center Limited, IBI Group agent. The Planning Act requires in Section 34, Subsection 12, that before passing a zoning bylaw amendment, Council must hold at least one public meeting for the purpose of informing the public in respect of the amendment. The purpose of this public meeting is to receive comments and answer questions from the public regarding the amendment to the Township of West Lincoln zoning bylaw. We stress that at this point, no decision has been made on the proposed amendment, and any comments received will be taken into account by Council in their consideration. The Planning Act requires through Section 34, Subsection 13, that Council advise the public that if a person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions to the Township of West Lincoln before the bylaw is passed, the person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision of Council for the Township of West Lincoln to the Local Planning Appeal Tribunal, or LPAP. So would the deputy clerk please advise of the method and dates by which notice of the public meeting was given. Proper notice was given by way of public notice sent out on December 12, 2019. Additionally, a yellow sign and notice was provided on the township's website and in the lobby of the township administrative building. Okay, thank you. So Mr. Barmer, you have this file, right? So will you please explain the purpose and reason for the proposed zoning bylaw amendment? Uh, thank you. If I could ask the deputy clerk to switch the screens. An application for zoning bylaw amendment has been submitted by IBI Group on behalf of uh, Silverdale Sports Center Limited 
for a property located on the south side of Concession 4 Road, west of Silverdale Road, and east of the current Silverdale Gun Club establishment. The subject pro property is a separate property from the main gun club establishment and is in different ownership. Uh, it's outlined in red on the sketch shown. The proposed zoning application is to rezone a portion of the subject property from an agricultural A zoning to an agricultural A zoning with an exception to allow portions of that property um, to be used for a gun club. Also portions of the property are currently zoned Environmental Protection EP. Uh, that is the darker gray coloring on that map. Four ranges were constructed on this property since 2010 according to our aerial imagery uh, without zoning or site plan approval. At least one range was built within a Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority regulated feature which is currently being removed by the applicants through a, a and assistance with the MPCA through a restoration plan. The applicants are now seeking zoning and site plan approval for four new ranges and for the four existing ranges, one being reduced in size. The zoning application was submitted with supporting studies which included a planning justification report, an agricultural impact study, an environmental impact study, a traffic brief, a geotechnical report, a hydrogeological study, and a site plan application. Written comments have been received from a member, one member of the public, as well as agencies, including the Region of Niagara and the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority. The region and the NPC have identified several areas of concern, uh, which can be found on page 15 of the report and have indicated that at this time they cannot support the application. Most agency comments relate to the protection of environmental features and alignment with agricultural policy. Staff in our report have identified five areas of concern with this application related to agricultural policy and two main concerns dealing with the environmental policy. As I mentioned, these can be found on page 15 of the report. Uh, essentially, staff are requesting that the applicant provide the township with some more information and more justification with regards to the proposal's alignment to the planning policy that's in place and potentially submit an additional official plan application um, if some concept of merger of these two properties is not provided. Environmentally speaking, there are concerns over the proposed development's proximity to key natural heritage features as well as the uh, proposed development within vegetative protection buffers. The township's planning staff are recommending that the applicant and their agent have an opportunity to review the comments that were provided by the agencies in the township, as well as either revise their zoning application and site plan as necessary. Planning staff then suggests that a meeting be arranged with the agent, their environmental consultants, and their um, staff from the MPCA and the region to go over the proposed changes prior to either holding an additional public meeting depending on the scale of the changes or prior to presenting a, a recommendation report to a future planning meeting. Staff further recommend that the applicant provide the township uh, with an official plan amendment to address the creation of a new non-agricultural use in the agricultural area as identified as the requirement in the pre-consultation meeting or alternatively the applicant can make a revised proposal which includes some concept of merger of the properties. Planning staff will also continue to try to reach out to the Ontario Chief Firearms Office uh, for comment on the proposal to address some of the concerns that were written about in the public, um, the letter from the member of the public which had some concerns about safety of the gun range and we'll continue to follow up with that. The applicant's agent from IVI Group are here this evening and also have a presentation for you. Okay, thank you. That was going to be my next question, is whether the applicant's agent wishes to speak. Where would you like me, Madam Chair? I think um, Alexa is going to move. Yeah. Mr. Arians, you haven't been here for a while, and so we've lost our podium and we now have a better solution. So. That's great. The microphone at the podium works so seldom that we've decided to right. change the plan, so. So thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Mayor, members of council, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is John Arians. I'm a planner with the IBI group, and over the years I've had the pleasure of doing a lot of development work in this municipality. Um, I've 
Typically, I work with uh, support staff, and in the past, you may recall, Mike Crow was with me on, on applications, Angela Bonamici was with me on applications, and Jared Marcus. Uh, one of the strengths of IBI is that we have over 40 staff in our Hamilton office, and I'd like to introduce uh, Brianne Comley to the committee members. Uh, Brianne is a planner. She's been with IBI for two years, and she's actually the project manager on the Silverdale file. I'm here as backup for Brianne today, so uh, hopefully uh, af after her presentation, both of us will be available to answer any questions, and I can assure committee that uh, we will continue to work with Mr. Treble and staff as we resolve um, you know, the environmental and servicing issues on this property. So with your permission, I'll turn it over to Brianne, and she can make the PowerPoint. Thank you, Mr. Arians. As um, Mr. Arian said, my name is Brianne Conley. Um, I'm with IBI Group and we're representing Joan Miller um, tonight. Ms. Miller is the owner of two adjacent, sorry, two adjacent parcels. The westerly parcel is privately owned by, by Mrs. Miller and the easterly parcel is corporately owned by Silverdale Sports Centre. Ms. Miller is the owner and operator of both of these parcels. Silverdale Gun Club is an existing outdoor recreational facility in the rural area of the Township of West Lincoln that has provided a variety of shooting ranges to members and non-members over the last 50 years. Silverdale is licensed by the firearms, sorry, the Chief Firearms Officer of the Province of Ontario and is legally inspected for safety compliance. Silverdale has an outstanding reputation and is well represented by both recreational users and public agencies. Um, sorry. Silverdale is not only used for training and competitive facilities by club members and visitors, but also used is also one of the few ranges across Canada to carry out appropriate police services, recertifications, and the required additional private training for specialized forces such as our CMP. <clears throat> Here in red, you will see the subject lands. Silverdale is located municipally at 4948 Concession 4 Road in St. Anne's. Um, the subject lands are approximately um, 41.5 hectares with a lot frontage of 593 meters and a lot depth of 700 meters. The surrounding uses are predominant re predominantly rural. Um, You'll see here on the, um, on the westerly par parcel, um, Joan Miller has an existing residential dwelling. In this location here, there's an office uh, as well as um, two trap shoots. And along here are seven legally operating gun ranges. Um, there are provincially significant wetlands and natural heritage features that run throughout the parcel throughout both parcels of land. Approximately three years ago, Silverdale installed four additional gun ranges on the easterly parcel, which you can see here in, in the air photo. This expansion was completed illegally as Silverdale did not have zoning permissions to expand the gun range. Therefore, bylaw enforcement has been involved in this property and that is why this application is before you today to address this issue. <clears throat> The, the proposed application is, is to rezone the subject lands from agricultural to agricultural special provision to allow for the legalization of four existing gun ranges and four proposed ex, um, outdoor gun ranges. This blue bubble here at the top of the site is not in front of you today, but it is a concurrent site plan application for a proposed indoor gun range on the existing footprints of buildings there today. The proposed indoor gun range will have a gross floor area of approximately 1,200 meters squared, which, is, which equates to about 13,000 feet, and will incorporate indoor gun ranges, offices, and, and uh, similar uses. This multi-million dollar facility will create tourism and recreational opportunities by providing the space for gun-related training year-round, ultimately contributing to long-term economic development to the town of West Lincoln. 
in the orange bubble here, you will see the four, the four ex existing illegal gun ranges and the expansion of four additional gun ranges. Approx approximately 1.3 hectares of active farmland will, re will be required to accommodate the above request. One of the existing illegal gun ranges, as Garrett has mentioned, disturbed a wetland feature and is being addressed through restoration plans um, to comply with required MPCA buffer zoning. This is a list of the, the supporting studies, reports, and drawings that have been submitted to, um, to support the rezoning application. The zoning bylaw submission was made on November 4th. The application was deemed complete on December 12th and the statutory public meeting is scheduled for today. At this meeting, Town Sef presented the technical report and a recommendation report is to follow after consultation, further consultation with the township and other agencies. <clears throat> the, current, the current planning status um, for the subject lands are designated um, good general agricultural and natural heritage system under the Township of West Lincoln official plan. Under the Township of West Lincoln zoning bylaw number 2017-07, the subject lands are, the majority of the easter par easterly parcel is zoned agricultural. The westerly parcel is ma uh, majority agricultural with special provision permitting a gun range and and both parcels contain EP, which is Environmental Protection Zone, um, throughout the entire site. Uh, block one here, you'll see in the, ha the hatched area, is the proposed um, area to be rezoned from agricultural to A7. Um, all the proposed development meets all minimum and maximum zoning requirements, and we are just requesting a, an adjustment boundary to the A7 zone to include the proposed expansion. The next five slides will analyze development issues that may have influence on the proposed development. <clears throat> a transportation impact um, brief was completed by Paradigm, and the concluding statements um, are as followed. 100 parking spaces are required by law. 135 spaces have been provided. Therefore, adequate parking has been provided. Concession 4 Road is relatively flat. Therefore, adequate sight lines are available from the proposed site entrance. No traffic safety concerns. No pre-existing traffic concerns during peak hours. No traffic concerns in future development. And no road improvements have been identified. An agricultural impact assessment has been completed by Colville. The conclusions are as follows. The construction of the proposed development will equal more efficient use of the land. A gun range is a compatible land use. 1.3 hectares of active farmland, class three soil, is being converted to, to expand the outdoor gun range. And there are no MDS-1 setback requirements. An environmental impact assessment has been completed by NRSI. Uh, the proposed development does not encroach into the identified key natural features. Minimum encroachments into headwater features and vegeta vegetative protection zones do occur, but mitigation, fe mi me sorry, mitigation measures are proposed. Through Im implementation of the mitigation measures, significant adverse impacts are not anticipated. Further clarification and additional details have been requested by the MPCA, the Township, and the Region. We have been working with our environmental team to review all the comments and NRSI believe all concerns and comments can be addressed without any issues. Further consultation with these agencies will occur in the near future in order to work towards a positive recommendation port to be brought forward to you in the, in the near future. Um, merging of the title. The main concern of the township and region in relation to the merging of title has to deal with in the introduction of a new um, gun club. <clears throat> there are, in order to avoid this, um, the, they have recommended a merging of title. 
Um, there are many alternative options to consider to avoid this concern, such as a site-specific zoning regulation and or a site plan agreement. Both of these options give the opportunity to restrict the proposed expansion of the, out the eight outdoor gun ranges to be operated in conjunction with the existing Silverdale Gun Club um, and remove opportunity for a second gun club to be created. A minor lot boundary adjustment is a, a third option. This option would propose to realign the westerly parcel lot line that currently divides the two properties to wholly include the proposed e expansion. This would effectively per sorry, this would effectively put the proposal in, under the same ownership of the westerly parcel of land. As you can see from the above examples, there are viable alternatives to merging of the lands and we are willing to work with the township to establish the best outcomes for everybody in this case. Um, safety concerns. The shooting club and shooting ranges regulations, also known as the Firearms Act, sets out extremely restrictive and rigorous regulations and rules in order to operate a shooting range and maintain a place of safe discharge for the purpose of target practice or shooting target shooting competitions. Continued compliance with the regulation is required and therefore regular site inspections are completed by the Chief Firearms Officer. Last summer there was a report to the Ontario Chief Firearms Office about a stray bullet in neighboring property. A site investigation was completed and the conclusion of the investigation was that the bullets could not have come from Silverdale. Contact with the Ontario Fire Chief Firearms Office has confirmed Silverdale is meeting all regulatory standards and is considered a safe gun club. Oops. Okay. Uh, public interest. Um, in order to evaluate whether or not the proposed development um, is within the public interest, it's beneficial to look at a variety of components. These include economic, social, and environmental perspectives. From an, eco from an economic perspective, the market demand for the gun range expansion demonstrates the need for additional land that will positively impact the economy. From a social perspective, the proposed development will increase capacities at which agencies can train to protect the public and increase opportunity for recreational activity use. And environmentally, in addition to the environmental impacts assessed in the previous slides, experiences and activities amid the natural environment have been proven to reduce stress and have a positive impact on human health and well-being. In conclusion, the proposed development effectively balances the pillars of sustainability, respecting good planning and being in the public interest. Approval of this application will, will create enhanced tourism activity opportunities, provide additional recreational services to the township, region and province, allow for continued enhanced police training and not result in any safety or adverse impact on the neighboring properties. In conclusion, approval of the proposed le legalization of the four existing gun ranges and the expansion of four additional outdoor gun ranges will be compatible with surrounding areas, be supportive of public, of planning for the public interest, not create traffic or safety issues, have ample parking and provide overall community benefits. Our proposed um, application complies with the intent and direction of the official plan. Okay, thank you. So I think we'll save questions until we get to the next portion, but stay tuned, please, Ms. Connolly and uh, Mr. Arians as well. So I'm going to now ask if there are any oral or written submissions from anyone present regarding the proposed zoning bylaw amendment. I would like to stress that this may be the only public meeting held with respect to this application. Therefore, if any members of the public would like to make comments and or provide written comments, they should state them or present them now, as the LPAP may not consider comments made during any other council and or committee meeting. Also, anyone wishing to speak is required to come forward to the microphone at the table and provide their name and address for the record prior to speaking. So we have a good-sized gallery. Is there anyone in the gallery interested in speaking to this application? Okay. Someone, someone's car is calling. <laughs> 
Okay, moving on then, I'm going to ask members of committee if they have any oral or written submissions on the proposed zoning bylaw amendment. Please note the members of committee must make their comments now, as the LPAP may not consider comments made during a planning, building, environmental meeting, and or any other council or committee meeting. So, members of committee. Councillor Riley. Pardon me? There, yes, there was no one from the public, and so now I've moved and I've just asked members of, you maybe were distracted, Councillor, by the horn and the <laughs> things going on. But we're on, we're on to members of committee. Okay. Councillor Riley. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, just, I had a question, I guess maybe I'll just uh, go through, Madam Chair, through you to Director of Planning, uh, Brian Trouble there. Um, and maybe, I, I just don't quite understand. Um, the difference possibly between agricultural and commercial. And the reason I ask is as I bring up this particular business on, um, on Google Maps, I, I see that also part of their website was a land shooting supplies uh, company that also takes residents in the same location. So I'm curious, with this particular application, does this permit commercial purposes as well? Through you, Madam Chair, um, the way the uh, zoning is is written for the property, it allows in the A-7 uh, zone for a gun range in addition to the agricultural uses normally found in the area. And without having the A A-7 zone in front of me, uses accessory to a gun range use would normally be allowed as sort of accessory uses. So. Yeah, so the Madam Chair, just to read into the record, the, the permitted zone right now for the property and what they're asking for for the expansion says, as per the parent zone, which is the agricultural piece, uh, private club limited to a gun range provided that no residential use shall be permitted except for an existing dwelling unless the gun club ceases and all related buildings and structures are removed. So I would interpret, though, the private club to include related uses accessory to the private club. So that would be, so this particular, like I'm just using their website here, um, directs me to another business that re resides in the same grounds as that one. Um, that This covers both? Is that what I'm understanding? Because right now, like if you actually go to the website, you see that there's a second business there that specifically focuses on gun supplies and they ship it to your door or you can come and pick up your... Um, your firearms or your ammo or whatever it is. So I'm under the impression there's actually two businesses that are operating under the agricultural, currently agricultural zone. So I just want some clarity as far as what's happening here. I think Madam Chair, Mr. Arians yes, can I maybe see speak that. better. Mr. Arians, would you like to answer that? Get the button to work. Uh, is it on? Okay. Yes. Sorry. Um, so accessory uses are permitted. Uh, an accessory use is anything that's subordinate to the principal use. The principal use clearly is the gun range. Uh, it's much the same, sir, as if we have a, a, an arena complex. Uh, a secondary or an accessory use could be a small sporting goods outlet. I mean, clearly the principal use is the playing of activities in the arena. The sale of sporting goods is accessory. Whether they deliver or have a mail order business, that, that's really incidental. The principal use is the recreational component. You could have a Tim Hortons in that arena. You could have a skate sharpening shop in that arena. They're all accessory uses. Similarly, on this property, the sale of firearms, uh, the sale of ammunition, uh, gun repair, those would all be accessory uses subordinate to the principal use, which is the rifle range. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess that's all I have. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Councillor Rayner. Thank you. Um, through to Mr. Borismo. Um, this situation came about because there was a report came in that there was a bunch of illegal rifle ranges, specifically four. Is that correct? I think Mr. Borma, it's to you. Through you, Madam Chair. Uh, there was a bylaw issue, uh, I believe it was relating to a, um, a building or a structure without a permit. And when staff were on the site to investigate that, uh, they noticed the additional ranges that were constructed sometime since 2010 on the adjacent piece of land, which is, was, which is zoned agriculture. 
uh, and does is not zoned to permit that use. So at that time it was. All right. Now there was discussion tonight through you, Madam Chair, that there is an additional four ranges that want to be added on top of the four that aren't supposed to be there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, through you, Madam Chair, there's a drawing of that. If Alexa, maybe you could pull that up, or Mr. Arians. Yeah. So on this diagram, you can see the the four existing berms on the south or on the very bottom. And the four proposed berms, or two that are proposed on the north side. I don't know if you can show that using the mouse. These two, and then these two are the new ones. These four are the existing ones, and this one extends into that wetland complex. So this one will be reduced in depth. So the, the purpose is to legalize these four, and then at the same time allow for these four more. So the total will be eight new gun ranges on agricultural lands today. All right, now I'm a little bit confused on gun ranges on agricultural land because when you go for your gun course, um, if you want to get the question correct when they ask you what, what is the safe distance for a bullet to travel, mm -hmm. you always click on the thing that says over a mile. Yes. So you're got agricultural land supposedly for agriculture but you've got bullets flying that could be dangerous in excess of a mile mm -hmm. how does that promote agriculture unless you want to get shot off your tractor okay. through the chair the, these these gun ranges are, are rigorously regulated by the province the chief firearms officer um, the, the I understand one, that but the, that's the why they were closed down last fall for nearly two months well, sir, if I can finish the, the answer, the, the lines that you see that I'm referring to here are, are berms. The berms are over 20 feet high, and in fact, Mrs. Miller has just added another five feet to them, so they're 25 feet high. The, the shooting areas have uh, a very in which you, you point your rifle. Any recoil will ensure that no bullet can stray above the berms. On top of that, there, there's also uh, discussions underway to, to further enhance the safety aspects by putting more or less a rubber screen on top of the berms as well. The, the likelihood of a stray bullet leaving this facility is so remote, sir, that it's, it's, it just doesn't happen. And in fact, there was an incident last summer. There was no proof from where that bullet came from. It could have been someone out shooting, could have been someone out hunting, could have been someone out target practice. We, we know it, it was reported about two weeks after the fact when the bullet was found. We have no idea where that bullet came from. The chief fire officer investigated and gave Silverdale an excellent clean bill of health. They're open and operating. But initially they were suspect and they closed them down. Well, sir, again, it's a very rigorous process. If there is a stray bullet, they investigate, and out of an abundance of caution, they closed them down while they did their investigation, well, I understand. and we'll then just... they opened them again. So it's just, that's the way the process works. All right. uh, through you to Mr. Treble. Mr. Treble, uh, there is a number of concerns by the region um, that objects to the existing illegal four. Are they objecting to each one of them individually or are they objecting to all four of them when they say they cannot support this? Mr. Treble. Through you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I think it's safe to say staff have a bit more work to do in discussions with the region to fully understand the nature of that question. There's no question the one that extends into the wetland area is, is clearly at issue. Um, however, I understand as well that there are additional wetland areas that have been identified as part of the study and some of the new um, some of the new ranges are also into potential setback concerns so it's it's a bit of a mix I think of, of uh, existing and new that have concerns as I understand it right now but staff will fully understand that before we come back with any sort of recommendation you, you, thank you mr. Trouble. Thank you, mr. You, mr. Madam Trouble. chair to mr. trouble again those four illegal ranges are they in operation right now or are they are closed until this thing is resolved through you madam chair um, 
Several years ago when the uh, issues of concern were brought to our attention, staff reached out to the Chief Firearms Office. Uh, we had a meeting actually with the Chief Firearms Office um, and they agreed to work with us and force the closure of those four until such time as they were legal. So to my understanding that is still the case and they are still closed. Um, staff do want to reach out to the Chief Firearms Office and actually have um, our own conversations with them before a recommendation report comes forward as well, just to make sure we understand the safety concerns and proper design and the whole bit. Thank you. Thank Again, you. through you, Madam Chair, to Mr. Tribble, uh, with regards to the region objecting, there was some other agency that also objected? Did, was that not pointed out? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, the Conservation Authority also has concerns. Because it's in wetlands? Because of the wetland, yes. And, and there are some significant species, rare and endangered species, that they've had to uh, address in that area as well. And that, through you, Madam Chair, is that being addressed now, or, or how are they looking after that situation? Um, I might defer to Mr. Arians or Brianne to uh, respond more detailed. My understanding is they started the work towards compliance, but I don't believe they're completely there yet. Okay, thank you. Mr. Arians, do you know more about that? So you may recall earlier last summer I was before Council on a site alteration permit for this property. Uh, we've worked very closely with the NPCA and the environmental agencies to, to deal with the removal of the illegal extension into the wetlands. There's a site alteration permit from the township. The Conservation Authority has issued a remediation type permit. Um, we, we, we not only have the berms to remove, but we have plantings to restore to make sure that that wetland feature, you know, it gets returned back to, to, to the way it is. As far as the other environmental features, um, I can best describe them as farm swales that have overgrown over the years. Uh, yes, there may be some habitat there. Our environmental en engineers and environmental scientists who've worked on this file are satisfied that we can mitigate and we can have appropriate setbacks. Uh, and that's why we're confident we can work with the Conservation Authority and the Township to not only legalize the four existing, but also to accommodate the four new. Um, the, the, the expansion is a very important component to Silverdale. I mean, they have world-class competitions at this facility, Olympic tra teams train at this facility, SWAT teams, police forces, Army, special forces, they all train at, at Silverdale. It, it's, it's, it's a going concern. And, and as, as Ms. Comley indicated, we are looking at a site plan application to add an indoor shooting facility. So it's part of the bigger picture here, and part of this over in this area have to be relocated so that there's a shuffling that's going on some of the gun ranges from the existing Silverdale will be moved to the to the new parcel and you know while it's eight on the new parcel cumulatively uh, it'll almost match what's existing today with the four additional ones thank you mr. chair I have a couple more questions okay go ahead please. Uh, Mr. Trouble, with regards to this one that's going through mediation, that is one of the four illegal ones at the present time? Uh, yes, as I understand it through you, Madam Chair, it is, uh, I don't know if Elsa can pull up the map again, it is the one that extends furthest south, as I understand it, that Mr. Arians is highlighting right now. So, Mr. Trouble, if they have to remediate that particular area because of what they've done to the natural habitat in the area, does that not eliminate one of those four then? No, my understanding through you, Madam Chair, is that the the reduction in the length of that uh, will actually bring it into compliance with the Conservation Authority uh, rules and regulations. So uh, I think it's yeah. a reduction, not a, an elimination. Um, the reason I ask, if there's a reason why it was that length for shooting purposes, if they have to shorten it up, then it therefore takes away the purpose of why they did it in the first place, which means it's no longer functional for their needs, and therefore it's probably redundant. That's why I asked the question. I, I, Madam Chair, through you, I understand the nature of the concern and a certain type of gun presumably wants a longer range. Um, I don't know if Mr. Arians can speak to oh, what's fine. happening Let's in, go there. in um, location of that. Just, if I may, Madam Chair, just okay. one other thing to put on the record. Um, I know there's concern about the, the, the bylaw infraction piece and the fact that um, four of these ranges were shut down by CFO at our request in order to get to the point of, of compliance. When staff look at an application, 
we have to look at the application as if it has been applied for in its first instance. So notwithstanding the fact that there's a history here, the application is being reviewed by the township. We'll look at uh, from a professional planning point of view if this is an appropriate location in, in the township in an agricultural area, and then if so, what's the right way to configure and develop the lands to minimize impacts on agriculture and the environment as part of our review. So Moving forward. As a public, okay. So right, I think right, the difference right. is, and we've had we've had files before us in the past where we have to try to um, mitigate, bring people into compliance in terms of um, things that have been done incorrectly. So so it is our goal to bring them into compliance. So just Thank hang on a minute. More. Well, I'm going to let, just hold a minute and just see if there's anybody on the other side. Any further questions on this side before we allow Councillor Rayner to go on? Okay, go ahead, then, sir. Thank you. No, this township does have a habit in the past of finding things and then coming back and asking for permission and, and, and saying I'm sorry and then asking for permission to do it instead of getting permission to do it right the first time. It's a common thing in West Lincoln and it's happened over the many years that I've sat here. So it's not unusual. They just come up every now and then. The last question I have through you, Madam Chair, to Mr. Treble is I believe there was a discussion that because the one property is owned by Joan Miller, the other property is not owned by Joan Miller. Is that part of the problem because they cannot um, put those two properties together and therefore make this flow a little smoother? Am I reading this right? For some reason there is, because there are two separate properties, they're not treated in the more simplistic way as if it was all under one ownership? Okay, okay. so I do think you need to explain that, Mr. Treble, please. I, through you, Madam Chair, I can attempt, and I, I think Mr. Arians can probably assist as well. Um, the question is, are we dealing with an expansion or enlargement of an existing facility, or are we dealing with a new facility? If it's two separate and distinct and conveyable properties that we have no way of stopping the sale of one without the sale of the other, then in theory, it is two separate and distinct properties, and therefore this is a new application, not an expansion. Mr. Arians and, and Brianne have identified uh, some ways that they're suggesting from a planning point of view we can get around that. But ultimately, that is a fundamental piece of the whole, the whole issue. If this is a new application, then as, as Mr. Burma has identified, there's an official plan amendment that's required as an extra step because there's heightened tests, heightened layers of analysis and evaluation that planning staff have to go through in order to allow a new facility into the agricultural area. Okay. So I, I too found that very difficult, just further to what you're saying, Councillor Rayner, in that we have, we have in, in some of the reports it indicates it's, it's like one ownership of two parcels of land side by side, but then somewhere along the line we also have another company name. It's been Silverdale Gun Club, and then suddenly it's now Silverdale Sports Centre Limited. And I don't know, having lived here a great many years, when that transaction happened or whether it's just happening as a result of this application. Um, so I, I think there are some, some conflicting pieces of information throughout all of the reports that, that really seem to complicate the matter even more. If it's one piece of land and it's owned and, and it's, you know, then it's an expansion. But if it's a new company coming in under this second piece, it doesn't really matter who owns that piece. It's a second piece of land and then it certainly is a new application. So I think that needs to be straightened out further. But back to you, Councillor Rainer. Thank you, Madam Chair. That brings up the point that the existing gun club has, what, seven ranges or something? Uh, or 11? Seven, I think, right? So these other four were added and were used by the Silverdale Gun Club, therefore almost as if that parcel next door was theirs anyways. So it, it, it doesn't make it look like they're, they may be owned by two different people, but it looks like there's a partnership of some kind. Or why would the person next door say, oh, yeah, I'll put four more ranges on my property and have your people come over on my property to shoot? There's a connection here somehow. Even though legally there may not be a connection, there is certainly something going on here. Mr. Treble. Madam Chair, Ms. Connolly, uh, Brianne spoke to that in one of her very early slides where she indicated that the the principal owner of is the Mrs. Miller. is Mrs. Yeah, Miller. Yeah, so yeah. it is the same person, but because the titles are different, they do not merge. That's done intentionally. When it happened, I don't know. Okay, so so one or the other. Either they need to merge, as staff has suggested, and then it's an expansion, or they need to deal with it as a new, under, under the way it's looking at this point in time. 
expansion is much better in their interests, I believe, than starting. Well, I don't know. There must be a reason for that they would have. Mr. Arians. I was just going to add to that. You know, Mr. Troubles explained it a right way that there are two legal separated properties, but they are operating as one with Mrs. Miller and Silverdale operating as one because she owns both. She is both. Um, whether we end up doing a little five acre severance and removing the ranges from this property and merging it with that one or whether the entire parcels merge or whether we build into the zoning bylaw that you can't sell one without the other. There are ways that we can deal with this. It, uh, I see it as a technical issue as opposed to do we give the approval yes or no. We'll, we, we can work out the ownership details quite easily. That's see, the least of my worries. Well, thank you for that, but it's one of my major oh, of worries course. in terms of how that I, works I, I out because I see, I see in terms of planning okay. two different okay. lines here, and I, I think we have to be careful about that. Okay. It would be easy to simplify. So while we're doing that, are you finished, Councillor? Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, because I also have a few things. Yes. Um, one of the things I was concerned about was um, the fact that the justification report um, goes at great lengths to talk about the economic benefits to the municipality and the recreational facilities offered to the municipality and so on. But I understand that it is a private club. Is, is Mrs. Miller here? I, yes, she is. Okay, so if you can't answer, then perhaps she could answer for me. So um, I also looked on the website, and I don't know how large the membership is. Okay. Is that possible to know how many members there are? We can certainly find out. Okay. And so based on that, then I wonder what the anticipation, um, first of all, I want to know how many are, of those are local members, because I do know that the Silverdale Gun Club started with many local people years ago, but we're talking 50 years ago or better. Mm -hmm. And I know that that has changed over time. So I want to know if it truly is of benefit to the municipality to expand this. You know, what the projection, what the business number is that says how, how large this club is going to get and whether there is um, an opportunity for people to actually from West Lincoln take part in this. Is it really a recreational facility that we would benefit from or not? Or is the only economic spinoff good for the property owners and the business owners? Because at this point in time out on concession four, there's not much spillage. There's not much happening in terms of what West Lincoln would gain from that. And so I see that uh, as as a justification report that in words sounds fine, but I'm not so sure in application it actually plays out. So I think that we need to look at that more carefully. And, and I would want to know a bit more about, about what that proposed business is and what it looks like in terms of um, actual benefits to West Lincoln. I, I, I just, I see a benefit definitely to the applicant. I don't see a benefit necessarily to West Lincoln. The other thing that I was concerned about that also I would like an answer to is whether um, the numbers, I know when they were looking in the hydrogeological report, and I, I've sort of taken that out of page 395 in our agenda package, um, it indicated when they were talking about um, sewage and, and the septic system that about nine staff members and 60 staff members per day would be calculated in terms of um, the septic bed that was necessary that would prevent any mitigation of spillage into any of the wetlands and so on. Mm -hmm. So I know also from looking on the website that there are many packages offered to members, specialty things and tournaments and are advocated and, not, and that was also mentioned in the report. So I wonder what those numbers are. The parking spaces certainly allow for way more than 60 people. Yes. Not many people would travel, I would think, by themselves. So I want to also know if that projection for days of tournaments or, or several days of tournaments running concurrently, whether that has also been addressed in terms of the, the septic bed. So I think, I think there's a bit more that we need to know about, about those effects and, and it's, as they relate also, of course, to the ecological areas. The, the, the simple question or the simple answer, Madam Chair, is that when there is a large event, porta potties are brought in as well to supplement uh, the septic system that's there. Well, so, you say that, but, but there's nowhere in the report no, I, or in anything that so, we have so that indicates that there's we, been any consideration given that way. We, so we'll I want to know. We provide those numbers to Okay. You. I want to know, does the 60 relate to what, the, to just the Silverdale Gun Club part, or is that the projected new number yeah. that they would be looking at? Because yeah. obviously they're looking at growth. Yes. And I want to know if in that growth, are they looking, you know, what, what figures are being used? Very good. Very simply. Okay. Okay. So. Nothing else there? Okay. Well, seeing nothing else then, and Mr. Arians, anything else that you wanted to add? No, I, I, I can, we'll certainly provide you those accommodation numbers. Um, as far as the benefits to the township, if, if there is a gun show here and 250 people attend, or if there's a competition, they're getting gas, they're, they're stopping for, you know, for fuel, for restaurants, accommodations in the area, 
Yeah. Uh, okay. You know, right. pe people travel from the states to attend the gun shows and the competitions here. Right. They have to stay somewhere. Not likely in West Lincoln at this well, point, but thank you. Maybe some way maybe. down the line. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. Maybe somewhere down the road. But anyway, thank you. You're thank welcome. you. Okay. So please be advised that a technical report is being considered by committee this evening and that a recommendation report will be forthcoming to a future planning committee and or council meeting. Please be advised that once the planning committee and or council has made a decision with respect to the zoning bylaw amendment and if approved by council, a notice of its passing will be circulated with an appeal period. There's an attendance sign-in sheet which is located on the table near the exit doors which we would ask all present to sign. Please ensure that when signing the attendance sheet for this evening's committee meeting that you place a check mark in the column marked Silverdale if you wish to be advised of any subsequent meetings and or decisions on this matter. Therefore, people who are interested in observing council and or committee discussions about a particular bylaw should not solely rely on mailed notices and thus miss the opportunity to attend the meetings. It is suggested that you watch the township's website for posting of agendas to review items that will be discussed at a council and or committee meeting. The agendas for meetings are posted on the township website at 4 p.m. on the Friday prior to the meeting. Additionally, meeting schedules are also noted on the website for the public to view. If you wish to receive notices by email, it is suggested that you include your email address with your mailing address and your phone number on the attendance sign-up sheet. This public meeting with respect to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment is concluded at the hour of 7.30. So that ends at this point in time our public meetings and we're going to be moving on to the remainder of the Planning, Building and Environmental Committee meeting. I'm going to ask members of committee if there are any changes and orders of items on the agenda. Okay, and seeing none, we have one appointment this evening. It's item 6.1 on your agenda, item P10-20, Dan Curry and Mike Campos, MHBC Planning, Urban Design and Landscape Architecture. Re Consultant's presentation for two former school sites being 186 Margaret Street and 132 College Street, Smithville, future redevelopment and intensification. And it's a PowerPoint presentation, so. Madam Chair, well, Dan is setting up if I could just say a couple of introductory points. Certainly. Um, just to refresh committee's memory, back in June of 2019, uh, we had a discussion um, at the planning committee level about the importance of sort of taking a leading role in the change of use of lands uh, in our community as we had an opportunity. Instead of always reacting to developers' applications, uh, doing some forward thinking and attempt to come up with some plans for lands that we know uh, will have uh, future demand. Um, in this particular instance, MHBC Planning was hired to take a look at the two abandoned school sites. Uh, these sites are very strategically located in proximity to our core area and are very important um, sites as we grow the uh, community of Smithville. Um, this concept of infill intensification is something you're going to start hearing a lot of as we go forward. The concept of growing communities requires us to take advantage of and uh, develop in the right way uh, lands that are strategically located and, and, and vacant inside the existing boundary and um, these must be uh, determined or, or developed before we can really grow our boundaries and expand into greenfield lands. So in this case, Madam Chair, MHBC Planning was hired at our request to complete um, plans for both schools. Um, both schools were made aware and in fact an interim control bylaw was put in place in June of 2019 to freeze development until we had a chance to determine what type of uh, development we think makes sense for the lands. Uh, notwithstanding that, I understand that the Catholic School Board has now put uh, the former St. Martin School on the market. Uh, staff have been receiving a number of inquiries, so this is very timely in terms of being ahead of the developers with respect to what they might want to do on those lands. So with that, Madam Chair, I'll turn it over to Mr. Curry. Okay, thank you, Mr. Treble. Mr. Curry. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, um, Brian described the project well. I don't have to go into that very much. My, my presentation really is to cover um, what I think are maybe the main points to understand uh, the conceptual demonstration plans that we've prepared and uh, speak to the implementation, etc. So, 
and again, Brian covered a fair bit of this, but the, the purpose of these demonstration and concept plans are to act as a guide for future development of the site. And really it's to demonstrate how that development can be balanced between achieving the intensification goals of the township and higher level planning policy, as well as manage compatibility of different heights, different densities with surrounding land uses. So uh, I'll, I'll speak to that with, with the demonstration plans, but also the document has a number of design guidelines that we envision that the township would use to, uh, to assist the township in reviewing the development applications as they came forward. So the two sites, the um, former school sites, the um, St. Martin School site is here. The township also owns a property uh, just to the east, which we've also included in the uh, concept plans. The College Street Public School is here, and we've also included, and I'll come to this in more detail, but this sort of um, really odd, irregular shaped parcel um, <laughs> as, as part of the, the design concepts. Um, and the other thing to mention, the purple area, that just identifies the uh, intensification area that's set out in the township's official plan as to where the majority of um, intensification and redevelopment is uh, encouraged. As part of this project, we've, we've done a whole um, policy evaluation and policy justification. <laughs> I'm not going to bore you with the details of that, but just the, the key parts are is that there is, prevent, as you know, um, members of committee, uh, all planning is done within the, the tiered system of the provincial and the regional and then the local uh, planning policy framework. The provincial policy encourages intensification, requires it in some manner. The region of Niagara official plan, for example, identifies that 15% of all residential development in the township must occur within the built up area. And again, the township of West Lincoln identifies an intensification area where um, you know, that redevelopment to higher densities is, uh, is encouraged to occur. Through the process, um, there was an open house that was held in November, uh, designed charrette to allow members of the community to provide their input. What would they like to see? What are their concerns about redevelopment? And if I distilled it down into the main themes, it would be those five points that are listed on the screen. Certainly concern with taller buildings, particularly adjacent to, uh, or, or maybe more particularly for residents that are close to, uh, to each of these properties. Concern with traffic and potential traffic that might impact or cut through adjacent properties. Development happens, it, it should um, enhance trail connections and linkages, pedestrian connections. Any development should be high quality in terms of the architectural to built form, but also enhance the streetscape, make it a better place to walk in particular. And then also recognition that the township um, has needs in terms of affordable housing, a range of mix and types of units that are available to, uh, to a lot of different folks. So from that, the, um, the document uh, that's been prepared contained a, a vision for each of those sites that it, uh, in, includes a lot of those, those uh, points that we heard from the community. And then from that, some particular design goals. So certainly to introduce additional residential density, but that is compatible. It speaks to safe and accessible, high quality design, a mix and range of residential units, pedestrian scale, et cetera. So the concept plans or the demonstration plan that's been prepared that identifies really what do we think is the, what we think is the best form of development. So the St. Martin school site is here and it's actually a challenging site. It's a long, narrow site. It's not easy to develop um, with access off Margaret and there's the potential to get access uh, through McMurchie Lane. The township owned parcel is here and doesn't include the lane, it actually is this piece here. The um, 
lands are surrounded to the south or adjacent to the south is uh, what I call low rise, low density townhouse development. To the north is the cemetery. Further to the west is residential development. And of course, downtown is just to the east. The, um, the way this site is organized is that the, the residential units are on the north side and really adjacent to the, to the cemetery with the parking lot. And then what we see is an opportunity for a, a, a really nice pedestrian connection that would allow for pedestrians to connect through the site and then to downtown. And that's done purposely to, um, to even though these are three, three to four story stacked townhouses, is on the north side of the site, there's really less impact um, on the adjacent residential to the south. That's really the main organizing principle. Um, you'll see a lot of parking, and that parking meets the township zoning requirement, one and a half spaces per residential unit. Um, there's not really a good way to get around that. Parking is required, um, and it will be, even though this is a um, site that's close into the downtown. There is opportunity on the township parcel to, um, it's further from the residential areas in, in general really, close and adjacent to the commercial properties uh, on Griffin. So there's opportunity there that a higher height would be compatible and more acceptable. So what we're showing is six stories. The, um, it, <laughs> there's not, the parking that's shown here, if this was a six-story building of 60 to 70 units, it would require some either structured or underground parking to be able to, uh, to uh, provide sufficient parking. Just some of the, the statistics on the school site, 90 units, that translates into about 70 units per hectare. On the township-owned parcel, depending on the size of footprint, uh, the size of units, 69 units, six stories, about 96 units per hectare. And that's a, just a conceptual rendering of, of <laughs> trying to do two things at once, show, show the, uh, the, the built form, but also identify that it's, it could quite easily be screened from the, from the south with the amount of landscaping that could be placed along that trail. The College Street demonstration plan, it's a much bigger site. There's, um, it has really access to two streets, College Street obviously, but then also Morgan Avenue at the north. And so there's opportunity here for a, a wider range of units. What we're showing in this concept plan, which uh, I think would be appropriate is, is two-story townhouses, regular townhouses along, what I'll call regular townhouses along Morgan Avenue. That would be a height to building form that really is compatible and very, very similar to, uh, to what exists today. Again, back or maybe the interior of the lot, um, opportunity for stacked townhouses. A little bit of density could be achieved here at, along the College Street frontage, uh, four-story apartment building. We're suggesting too that that might be an opportunity for some mixed use, some commercial or potentially office on the ground floor. Um, and particularly if it is, then it should be close to College Street to provide that environment. See here this zigzag shaped parcel, and it is a separate parcel. It has frontage on St. Catherine Street. There's a house uh, there now, or a building there now. This property, the, the development potential of that property really is tied to the redevelopment of the school site in that it's on its own. You really couldn't get much more than maybe what is there now, or maybe a little bit different development at, at the um, frontage on St. Catherine Street. So the back of the property, if it were to be developed in um, partnership or concert with the school site, there would be the opportunity to get um, some additional units on that site. It also provides the opportunity for a potential pedestrian route trail crossing, and we've shown a connection through to the new uh, development that's going on. Um, oh, Brian, I've forgotten the name. Mars. Mars. Mar yeah, thank you. <laughs> And there is the uh, future park you can just see here in the top corner that is planned. There's, a, there's an opportunity for a trail connection through there. So that's one of the other reasons for, you know, considering that this, these lands might develop together. Uh, it would require, you know, any future owners of the school site, uh, existing or future owners of this site to work together. Um, 
be difficult for the township to force that to happen, but I think there's an opportunity there. Again, range of, of units, um, you know, in this concept, approximately 100 units results in just under 50 units per hectare overall, a range of heights of two to four stories. Potential rendering, this would be looking north on College Street. That's a, a four-story building and, and considering that there might be commercial on the ground floor with a higher uh, height really to a first level to accommodate um, retail. So there were a number of design principles we identified at the beginning of the project. The, um, these concepts, these demonstrations fit very well. They provide connectivity, active transportation. I'll just summarize briefly. They, there's, a, there's a number of components for each of these principles that they would, they would mesh with. And one of the primary things was looking at how do you achieve density, range of different types of units that are um, not the prevail prevalent form of housing in the township, but how do we do that and still maintain some compatibility? Again, a variety. There's opportunity for amenity area, maybe not so much uh, parks, but amenity area. And uh, I think it, it minimizes uh, the conflict between pedestrians, vehicles, etc. So then in terms of the implementation, where the, uh, one of the goals of, of this project is, is to inform um, any official plan amendments, zoning bylaw amendments that the, the township might initiate. Um, official plan amendments would be needed for all of the, all of the um, lands, in part because the school sites are currently designated institutional. Um, so our recommendation on implementation and be redesignated to high density residential, be rezoned appropriately to the RM3 uh, zone. Similarly, the township parcel, it's already designated high density but that designation has a maximum height of five stories, so there might need to be a special policy um, uh, area implemented. Uh, the zoning would have to be uh, rezoned to RM3. College Street, similar, uh, redesignate to uh, high density residential. The irregular shape parcel um, would also have to be re redesignated and rezoned. And with that, I believe, yes, I would conclude. And if there's uh, any questions, I'd be, be happy to entertain them. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for your presentation. Members of committee, Mayor Belsman. Yeah, so um, just uh, at the outset, um, thank you for the, the concepts. It puts put a bit of um, uh, an expert advice uh, forward for us to consider. Um, I appreciate the uh, sensitivity to the built form uh, making sure there's a good interface, uh, but you know, uh, you acknowledged right from the beginning, and we acknowledge all the time, or are faced with the fact that there's provincial uh, legislations and regional uh, uh, considerations with respect to planning and getting our um, our densities up. Uh, I just wanted to uh, commend um, you know the, the presentation just by saying um, appreciate the desire to. Find trails and connectivity, uh, pedestrian of a pedestrian nature. Uh, uh, there are uh, times um, when, believe it or not, I actually come from a rural setting and I come into town and I uh, grab an ice cream cone with my wife and maybe a couple of my kids, depending what I'm feeling like that time, whether I want to hang with my kids or not. But. Uh, just walking through the neighborhoods, uh, I, I like the idea of more connectivity to kind of find those little um, those little um, sidewalks, kind of in the hidden sidewalks, and come into a new neighborhood and just walk up the street. and And uh, uh, I think that there's a couple of key parcels that are being uh, considered. Uh, obviously, the College Street and the, um, uh, the uh, St. Martin School. Uh, Kind of form hubs. They kind of form uh, uh, opportunities to uh, have pass through some uh, pedestrian pass through, and so to have that in there, I think is going to be very important for making uh, our um, municipality very, very walkable, very accessible. Um, allow for people to um, mingle, perhaps in the amenity area. So I, I think that uh, you satisfied one of the concerns that I had with respect to uh, trail connectivity and making the, uh, these uh, concepts uh, very workable in that way. This is something that if uh, the, the whole process proceeds 
kind of as we envision it, I'll make sure and ensure that those uh, remain, um, you know, when the development community has their play on this, we're going to try, you know, uh, to, to uh, exert maybe some pressure in one direction or another, and I want to make sure that that, uh, that uh, I appreciate that that's in there now, and, and I, and I uh, would uh, continue to support that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, Mr. Treble. Sorry, Madam Chair. If I may, just one other piece to throw out on the table so everyone's got sort of a fulsome picture. Um, staff and, uh, and Dan and his team uh, met uh, a week and a half ago or so and had some discussions around, uh, around his concepts. And the one piece that, that concerned us a little bit that we are going to explore a little bit further is the, the, the traffic piece just conf confirming how uh, flow will occur properly from these sites. Um, St. Martin one especially comes to mind with, with Wade Road, McMurchie Lane and Smith's Cove being basically the three key pieces and how this added uh, population and, and, uh, and car mix will fit into that. Um, and at the same time, we will take a look at College Street as well. Of course, we've got Brock and, uh, and College both outletting near the traffic light, so it is not necessarily uh, an ideal uh, situation. So just for the record, Madam Chair, the, 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 the concept as, as uh, I see it right now, once we've heard from Mr. Curry and we've had a chance to sort of absorb uh, the concepts, we'll receive at some point in the not too distant future a traffic piece to go along with this and then that will lead us into the formal public meeting process that we have to unfold in order to make the official plan uh, changes and, and zoning changes to implement these kinds of concepts. Okay, thank you Mr. Treble. I'm sure that there are people in, in the gallery who are happy to hear that their traffic is still being addressed. Um, I would just like to make a quick comment um, alluding to the fact too that who um, the people that I heard from after the charrette were very concerned about um, the fact that people assumed that the, that the Wesley Gardens area, that those roads could be connected and mm -hmm. so on and I'm sure that many of those will, people will be relieved to see that that you've been very considerate of um, trying to interface between that existing um, almost a small community into itself within our community um, but, but but I like the fact that that you've really addressed that issue quite well and certainly there's more work to go but I think that that was a great start so, Thank oh, you. back to Mayor Bills Megan yeah, my apologies uh, there was just one more thing that I, I just in terms of a concept uh, through you, um, Madam Chair, even to uh, the planner or to uh, Mr. Curry, uh, I, I think there is a small opportunity for um, uh, some retail on the um, north end of the uh, building proposed for the parcel that uh, Township owns already, just because it interfaces onto that McMurchie Lane. Um, there is some some. Um, commercial establishments along there and I think it would it would uh, just you know even just to the end and the part that faces the, the lane I'll allow for um, uh, developing that Mer Murchy lane in, in a kind of a uh, maybe kind of a walkable uh, uh, market style like a nice uh, little cafe or something <laughs> you know and I and it, but I would I would consider it not necessarily the whole ground floor of that building but that end that's on the, on the McMurchy Lane a couple of small units in there to match the um, the uh, I think there's a, a little gift shop in there and there has been different things there in there, different and, things there. And, and I think it would be um, uh, also addressing a bit of the built form of that street so uh, that was just a little brainstorm another, that I another little nugget good yeah. okay any Councillor Riley. Did. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I, as as uh, uh, I'm sorry, Director of Planning mentioned about the the flow of traffic. I know that was one of my concerns. I, I really don't see how we're going to be able to support traffic going both ways on that road personally, considering how close it is to light. So I imagine, and obviously I'm not an engineer, um, but I'm hopeful that if that road is to be addressed, that it will hopefully be addressed by a one-way maybe entering towards the residences, if that should proceed that way personally, um, but then that kind of forces all those vehicles to go out the other side. So I feel like there's still um, I don't know, a little bit more work to consider here. But considering what this originally looked like, um, I'm definitely happier with what I see here than what I saw originally. Um, but uh, I guess we'll wait and see what the, uh, the finalized report will end up looking like in the future. So okay. thank you. Seeing nothing further, nobody else second guessing? 
Okay. Thank you, Mr. Cree. Um, so, members of the gallery, just so that you're aware, um, this, this is not at all the same format that you were at when you were at the charrette, those of you who were there. But we do have, following on this appointment and, and Mr. Curry being able to, to get out of that most uncomfortable chair, um, we have an area that we call request to address items on the agenda. And since this was already on the agenda, if you came tonight hoping that you would be able to make a comment, this will be your opportunity to do so. So, um, and I'm going to read to you what it says. Request to address items on the agenda. Section 10.4, 5 and 6, general rules. One hour in total shall be allocated for this section of the agenda and each individual person shall only be provided with five minutes to address their issue. And it does say some exceptions reply because it goes on to say that um, a response may not be provided and the matter may be referred to staff. A person who wishes to discuss a planning application, which this is not, or a matter can be, that be, can be appealed would be permitted 10 minutes. So at this point in time, I, I know that some of you came and, and I don't know whether you wanted to speak or not, but this is the opportunity where, because this was on our agenda, you may speak to it if you wish. So is there anyone in the gallery tonight that wishes to come to the podium and talk about this issue? Okay, so we'll start with you, sir. If you would like to come forward and you can sit in this end seat. We'll make sure the microphone is on for you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And if you'll state your name, please, and where you live, and then go ahead. My name is Ken Way, and I live on Village Drive in uh, Smithville. Um, my concern, as was your concern, is the amount of traffic and the amount of cars. Now, we're in a small, low-level community. Um, the diagrams are great, except three and four tier seems a little excessive. And the thing of my concern is, prior to this conversation, we talked about the, or you talked about, the gun club. The gun club, under West Lincoln's uh, restrictions, must have 100 parking spots for a gun club out in the rural area. On Margaret Street, they're allowing 120 spots for 90 units. 120 parking spots is not going to do it. Basically, one and a half families have, well, they have two cars, but say one and a half families. So 120 parking spots for 90 units, definitely not going to be enough. And then when you add the township's property, they have 35 parking spots out front on 69 units. So that underground parking better be deep because they're going to have to put a lot of parking down there. And this parking is going to overflow into the community. The other problem is, with almost 200 cars in that five-acre slot, I can say the pollution is going to increase. There's no question about it. And my other question is, will the sewers in Smithville handle that kind of, of uh, activity? Now, the thing is, I have no problem with the units on St. Martin's, but three high seems a little excessive for a smaller community like ours. So two unit high would be probably more acceptable, and the parking would probably be in line. And the same with the apartment building further, uh, four or five high for the parking. But um, that is one of my concerns, and it's already been addressed that McMurchie Lane and uh, Wade Street and West Street, they're going to have to put lights out there because the amount of traffic going out of there in the morning is going to be backed up severely. And like I say, that is a small area to put almost, uh, well, 90 and, and 60 units, seven, almost 70 units. Um, I'm not sure what the size of the units are going to be, but they'll probably be normal sizes. But that's, that's what I wanted to bring to the table, is the fact that I sit on my back deck and I'll be right across from those units with all those cars there. And I'm sure that they're going to be starting and stopping and running through, and it's going to change 
uh, our way of living in that community if they try and ram too many units in that area. So anyways, thank okay. you for your Thank comment. you very much. And you stayed within your five minute limit. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is Joyner. Good evening. I didn't um, come prepared to speak, but I, I'm not new to Smithville, as most of you know. Um, currently, I am a director on the board of the Condominium Corporation in Wesley Gardens, which is number 209. I know that the presentation tonight was informative. I was not able to come to the November 12th um, meeting, but having said that, it's only a presentation to show what is acceptable by our governments, right? Yeah. The region, the township, and even the Ontario government. But I want you to be aware that there are not just one corporation in Wesley Gardens. There's three. So you've got three different boards, all managed under the same property management company. So I would hope that the planning department and the powers to be would realize that number 209, um, where I live on Jenny, is actually um, responsible for and owns Dove Lane, not Smith's Cove entrance or the cul-de-sac, but we own and we are responsible. The other two corporations are not responsible. We pay for snowplow, there's a liability there. My question would be, or my comment would be to consider Dove Lane in your thinking towards the future. Um, I would question the traffic flow into our residences. Um, it, it's no doubt in my mind that we need to grow, Smithville will grow, but we've got to be careful how it happens. And my concern is Dove Lane. Um, whether it gets expropriated or whatever, we still, as an individual corporation, are responsible for that lane. And his presentation in one picture, I can look at it and see that it was planned to come into the cul-de-sac part, which is it, it is township owned, but the other part isn't. So I would want you to address that when your plans come together, when the property's bought, which it isn't right now, but it, it'll, it will happen. There'll be development there, and just to be aware of it. When I talk about, and I think about McMurchie Lane, having been born and raised on McMurchie Lane, <laughs> I could be of a, you know, an assistance to tell people more about the traffic flow. I conducted a business on that laneway for 26 years, so I'm not new to the table here. Have sat on committee adjustment in my past. Um, would like just to, to let everybody know that there is some concerns by the residences that are here tonight for the traffic flow mainly and the density. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak during this time period? John Brierley, 26 Garden Drive. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's one thing that I, I wish you would consider before any of this goes through is that Wesley Gardens is private property. And I would like you to consider some way of allowing us to close that off to through traffic, whether it be a gate in the center to provide access for Garden Drive to go out one way, uh, the other corporations to go out the other way that would be openable for a garbage collection and fire department, uh, not necessarily lockable, but in some way to close that off, that it cannot be used as through traffic because I can guarantee you put the people out onto that Smith's Cove and I know what kind of problem it is trying to get out of that stupid street at certain times of the day and West Street, it's going to be a nightmare. I, 
personally, I cannot understand why this uh, the government is going for this. Uh, what do they call it? Intensification. Intensification in a rural township that cannot support this type of uh, growth through its medical, through its sewers, and through its uh, lines of uh, traffic. It's just, in my mind, it's incomprehensible that this is even being considered. Uh, the Margaret Street, uh, the school area there, the second uh, concept that they had at the November meeting is the way that we would like to see it go, is the, uh, town, uh, the corporation similar to ours, the single story uh, used for um, the retirees because that would be about the only thing that would make that particular block of land possible. The concept number three that came out just recently, those stacked townhouses are actually a ridiculous situation because they have no garages. You're gonna end up with what they have at the Dove, Dove Corporation. You're gonna have garbage all around each unit They've got no place for storage. Uh, you've limited the, uh, uh, that concept has limited the amount of, uh, the type of person that can live there to accessibility. Uh, coming in the future is going to be electric cars. There's no garages to plug an electric car into. There's no spots for that anywhere. The environmental impact of something like this stack townhousing idea is just outrageous in this area. We've seen what they've done to Bimbrook. We've seen what they've done to uh, Ancaster. You see it in Stony Creek, and now they want it here. I'm sorry, but uh, I think a lot of consideration is gonna have to go into this. Okay, thank, thank you. you for your opinion, and thank you for your time. Anyone else? Okay, please. My name is Christine Bernacki. I also live in Janet's neighborhood on Riverside Circle. Um, one issue we've had <clears throat> a few years ago, and then I think it arose again this January with the sudden thaw and lots of rain in January and tons of water coming down the creek is um, we live in a, a, I understand, a car-spaced area where there's a lot of underground water fissures and, and rivers under our houses and we've had one homeowner I know who's now been flooded out twice. Um, nothing to do with this sump pump not working, it's just the water seeping up from underneath his unit. Now, my, and I know many people in the neighborhood, their sump pumps are running all the time because they just happen to be built on an area where there's a lot of water under their unit. So I'm just wondering, you know, or wanting to ensure that if all of this gets built, that there's strong consideration to given to the sewer systems and how that's gonna be handled and what's the impact to our community with water outflow or, or sewers and um, stormwater management for all these new units and especially with this amount of asphalt parking spots, like where is all that water going? Because we have our own retention pond that we maintain and manage that flows we just can't take that water into our community or our homeowners can't support anymore. Some people already have two backup pumps going on. There's some pumps that have actually added a second pump is my understanding. So I'm just hoping that that's really strongly considered with any future plans for okay. this area. Drainage is always a big issue in our area, but thank you yeah. for pointing that out. Good, okay, thank you. Okay, okay last call, okay. It takes a few brave people to go first, and then I, you're good, I right? also live in the Wesley Garden subdivision, y your and name, my sir, main concern you is You have to just, give the clerk your name, please. Oh, Alex Bernacki. Okay, thank you. And uh, my concern is mainly with the, the amount of units that are in here, and again, I'm referring to the amount of traffic. Uh, if you go out Smith's Cove right now, with the coming out onto a blind corner, as you come around the corner over the bridge, 
the sight lines are limited, 69 units, potentially 140 cars. Again, there's going to be lineups on Smith's Cove to get out of there in the morning in the rush when people are going to work. I hope that traffic studies are implemented in the approval of this. Also, the same thing applies to the McMurchie Lane. You know, 100 and some odd units, all trying to merge in either uh, through uh, Wade Road or onto Griffith Street. Going to be a traffic nightmare, especially with the light being that close. So again, I hope that's taken into account. And I say this because over the past years that we've been living where we are, again, private property, as with the people in Garden, steady flow of traffic to our neighborhood because anybody that lives on Wade does not use Highway 20 as their main route to get to downtown. They come to our subdivision. And we've expressed our concerns even going as far as informing the police, see if they could monitor that because not only is it the volume of traffic, but also the speed of the traffic coming through our subdivision. Mm -hmm. And as my wife pointed out, we don't see any mitigation of stormwater anywhere on these plans. Well, these plans are at a very high level, you would realize, and that would come later on. But, anyway, but, but it's been pointed out, and it, it's well to yeah. point it out, that's mm -hmm. fine, but you would not expect to see them okay. at this point so, in time. But traffic studies are going to be implemented in anything that gets uh, approved? Mr. Treble. Yeah, through you, Madam Chair, the traffic piece is key, and I, and I think I'm hearing the residents agree with that. The, the other piece I just want to throw out there, um, it's been said several times, there's three condominiums, I acknowledge that. They have linkages that get from Smith's Cove through to Margaret and hence to Wade, but it is private. So I don't think the township council or staff really have any say over the flow of traffic through there, if the condominiums jointly choose to do something to regulate flow, I think that's an internal issue between the three condominium corps. It doesn't involve the town as I would believe it to be. So I, I throw that back there. I don't know that that's relevant to this discussion. That can be dealt with now or could have been dealt with years ago. So in dealing with it though, then you would want to make sure that that, that your condominium associations, the three, as, as Janet pointed out, all kind of have worked together on that. But, but I think the fact that your roads as such no longer appear in the plans to be connected to this new concept are, is really a key piece that, that has look, been addressed. Look at it this way. If you're coming out and there's a big backup on Smith's Cove, which, what do you think the residents of those apartment buildings are going to do? They're going to make a right turn and go to our subdivision to get out to Wade and if they're heading in a westerly direction. It's just a natural route. Private property is not respected. We pay for those roads out of our own funds and yet everybody gets to use them. That, that's totally unfair. Beside the fact that when the 14 units on, on the Sunnendale Court were approved for development, no agreement was made to cost share and the cost of uh, plowing, maintaining, repairing Dove Lane. They were just basically said, uh, 209 is paying, 209 gets to inherit the bill. Okay. Again, that's a, that's, that was approved by our planning department. I don't know. We pay for somebody else's use. Okay, thank you. Okay. Just, yeah. Mr. Did you want to say something further, Mr. Trevor? Just, um, I guess, just to point to the to the last point, the arrangements between the various condominium corporations. There are condominium uh, declarations and and agreements that exist between each of the uh, own, unit owners and their board, and the details of those are beyond the township as well. So the township didn't approve the condo declarations or any of those details around. Um, who pays for what? That was all Nothing internal, to to and and I believe the board of directors has the power to correct that if there is an issue. But it requires cooperation between the three condos, I'm sure. So yeah, it you. will be tricky, I can imagine. Yeah. Councilor Ryder. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, maybe to you to back to Director of Planning. Um, is there anything in the way that would prevent uh, Wesley Gardings from being a gated community? Through you, Madam Chair, not from my perspective, but I'm sure insurance and as we just heard, fire might have things to say about that. But I don't really see that as being a township 
discussion directly. Okay. I'm just curious if there is anything we had somewhere in our rules okay. that was preventing them. So, members of the gallery, I think everybody, I don't see anybody else who wants to speak further to this unless I've missed somebody. Okay, thank you then. We're going to move on then with the rest of our agenda. Thank you for taking part in that and expressing your concerns. As you heard earlier, there will be many more meetings to come down the road. So, we're on number eight. You need a recess? Okay, I have a request to recess for five minutes. So in five minutes, we'll move on. So, yeah. Okay, I did really whack it. <laughs> Not me, but we are going to get this meeting going again. We're on, for those of you following on the agenda, consent agenda items. All, all items listed below are considered to be routine and non-controversial and can be approved by one resolution. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a council member requests it in which case the item will be removed from the consent resolution and considered immediately following adoption of the remaining consent agenda items. So under item P11-20, consent agenda items, the recommendation is the following. That the Planning, Building, Environmental Committee hereby approves the following consent agenda items. Items 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 are hereby received and item 6B and is hereby received and that the recommendations contained therein be adopted. Number one is a municipal, multi-municipal wind turbine working group, minutes of the November 14, 2019 meeting. Number two, the multi-municipal wind turbine working group financial statement. Number three is a technical report, number PD-020-20, zoning bylaw amendment, Silverdale Sports Center Limited, IBI group agent. Number four is a technical report, number PD-025-20, zoning bylaw amendment, Kellett and Henderson, 27 Last Road, Merritt, 29 Last Road, and Peter Budd agent, file number 1601-021-19. Five is an information report, number PD-034-20, road allowance, Goldenberg road allowance update, final stages. And number six, a recommendation report, PD-032-20, Road Allowance Transfer, Donald Elmer and Virginia Louise Hipwell, part road allowance between lots 24 and 25, concession four, former Township of Gainesville, Township of West Lincoln, as shown on the attached location map. So I need someone to move this, please. Councillor Cody and a seconder, Mayor Bilsma. All right. So all those in favor? And seeing nobody else, that motion carries. Okay. Under communications number nine, item P12-20, Mrs. Sunny <laughs> Hunter McCollum, restraint naming policy and list. Recommendation that a letter from Mrs. Sunny Hunter McCollum, who I've known for a long time, I just, I never see the Hunter in the middle before, requesting that the name Hunter be included as part of the street naming policy and list be received for information and referred to the Heritage Committee. So I need someone to move that, please. Councillor Riley and a seconder, Mayor Bilsma. Okay, are there any questions or comments about this? I just had a Councilor quick Cody. question. Um, I'm assuming Hunter is a maiden name. Yes, and that I was it. I knew she had been a Hunter. We had a but. rule about using people's names for streets. Okay, so I think the mayor wants to speak to that because of the Heritage Committee, right? Yes. So go, please. Okay, so just. Uh, we have uh, adopted a policy to form a list of names of those people who ha are um, uh, significant contributors to the settlement of the area. And so uh, hence you'll see names like uh, Comfort Road and, and um, uh, Dengo Road and, and Snyder Road and they are the, um, the forebears. You know a lot, a lot of times they're United Empire Loyalists and so we commemorate them through our, our names. So. Um, um, I'm assuming uh, uh, Ms. McCallum is um, her maiden name Hunter um, 
you know, appears on some of those early settling maps. And so it's not necessarily something like you can move into town and have your name put forward. It, it right. does tie to the settlement. Um, um, and, and we looked through the old atlases at the, on the Heritage Committee and went through um, lists of names on the old atlases and, um, and basically compiled that list and, uh, as best as we could. And, you know, uh, it's very legitimate for someone to come forward and say, hey, you know what, our ancestral family name is not right. being considered. doesn't mean that it will actually show up in a name uh, blade someday, but um, it's a better chance when it's on that list. So thank you for that, Mr. Mayor. So when the list was put together, the, it, there was a caveat that other names could be additionally added to that list as it went forward. I think, um, and the reason I s sort of smirked at Hunter, I I'd forgotten about that. I, I knew I knew Mrs. McCollum's mother when she lived in town many years ago, but it was a great many years that I knew the two of them before I realized that family relationship. But um, the Hunter family ha appears many times also in the new history books that have been written in the last several years um, based on old stories in Smithville. So. Um, you know, I, I think this is a great idea, and I think you know Mrs. McCollum is, is now a lady who has been married close to 60 years, if not 60 years, and so she's probably now looking at this opportunity, thinking, well, it would be nice moving forward if if her maiden name also appeared on the list. And as as the mayor has stated, remains to be seen whether you know that will be used at some point in time or not. But I certainly think that um, it, this should be forwarded to the Heritage Committee to to Perfect. see. This, thus okay. far, all I've had to go by was like the, the new subdivisions. The new things in coming in. Yeah, so exactly, cool. exactly. So, so we say that we want to take a, at least 50% of the names from the list, but we also have an open list that can be added to when, if it's deemed appropriate. So, okay. All right. So, um, so the recommendation then, as I've read, has a mover and a seconder. All those in favor? Thank you. That motion carries. Okay, we're now moving on to staff reports. So the first is item P13-20, Director of Planning and Building, Brian Treble, re report number PD-033-20. It's an information report, a consultant's presentation for the two former school sites being 186 Margaret Street and 132 College Street, Smithville future redevelopment and intensification. The recommendation is that report PD-033-20 regarding information report consultant's presentation for two former school sites being 186 Margaret Street and 132 College Street, Smithville. Future redevelopment and intensification dated February 10th, 2020 be received for information purposes. So I'm still going to ask for a mover. Councilor Riley and a seconder. Councilor Jonker. And we're just accepting it for information purposes. All those in favor? And that motion carries. Okay, item P14-20, Director of Planning and Building, Brian Treble. We report number PD-029-20. Again, the recommendation is one, that report PD-029-20 regarding the proposed amendment to building fees bylaw dated February 10th, 2020 be received. And two, that a bylaw be passed at the Township Council meeting of February 24th, 2020 to implement new septic permit fees as included in the draft bylaw found at attachment two to this report so that they take effect on March 1st, 2020. So someone to move that please, Mayor Bilsma. And seconder, Councillor Cody. Any questions or comments? Councillor Rayner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Through to Mr. Treble. <clears throat> Where is the majority of this increased cost coming from, Mr. Treble? I know there's a lot of calculations done based on my own personal experience. When you submit um, an application for a build, they, they take a look at the size of the facility, the number of washrooms, et cetera, et cetera. And they do uh, the calculations and all the rest of that stuff. But as far as the inspection part, um, my experience has been that, well, maybe because it's done right, but they don't stay very long. Um, so there's, as you can appreciate, there's probably not a lot to see because it's not even functioning. You're just looking at a, a basic pit. But I'm not quite sure where the increase in costs is coming from. Um, maybe if you can explain that in a little more detail, please. Okay. Mr. Treble, please. Through you, Madam Chair. Um, 
This is to cover administrative costs, and uh, there was a confidential report discussed at planning committee last month that explained in some detail um, for committee and council uh, the nature of the, uh, um, the reasons behind this request. So I think we'd, I'd have to go into confidential to explain that more fully, Madam Chair. Thank you. So it was discussed prior. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Okay, so you have heard the resolution moved by council, by Mayor Billsman and seconded by Councillor Cody. All those in favor? Okay, and that motion carries. Okay. Moving on then to item 10.3, item P15-20. Uh, Director of Planning and Building, Brian Treble, we report number PD-030-20, recommendation report, part lock control application process. The recommendation is as follows. Number one, that report PD-030-20 regarding recommendation report part lot control application process dated February 10, 2020 be received. And two, that staff be authorized to review applications to lift part lot control and when appropriate, advise council by memo and place the corresponding bylaws in the list of bylaws for the passage by council only. So I need someone to move that, please. Mayor Vilsma, second. Councillor Riley, any questions or comments? Madam Chair. You'd like to explain, Mr. Treble? Just, just really briefly, Madam okay. Chair. Um, committee will recall back in, in January, it actually started just before Christmas, there was a bit of a panic on behalf of one of the developers to get uh, part lot control approvals quickly because of closings. Um, normally, I would, I would advise that closings are set by somebody else and they're not the township's concern, but there was uh, just this um, timing issue because of the Christmas holiday season that, that fell in the middle of all of that. So it was raised by uh, Councillor Trombetta during the public process that it would be nice if there was a way that staff could in some way streamline some of the processes. This is an effort to do just that. Um, the part lot control piece is one that when I investigated it, I was able to find that there were uh, simpler ways to uh, deal with part lot control than the way we have historically done things in West Lincoln where we take a report to committee, that report then goes to council, gets ratified, then the bylaw gets put on the agenda. There is a way that if you can rely on staff to do the full review process, then we can simply just take a memo to council and put the bylaw on the same night and it short, shortens the process by at least two or three weeks, I would say, in, in most cases. So that, Madam Chair, is what the essence of this report is. I can't get away from council's rule because there is a bylaw required, but it shortens the steps we have to take. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the Councillor Jonker? Yeah, to you, uh, through you, Madam Chair, to Brian. I guess this is to deal with when we get lots 57, 58, 59 from that subdivision coming to council, right? That's what this is yeah. more dealing with? That's correct. We've, we've dealt with maybe six or eight, and there's another six or eight to come, so this is to sort of help those ones along. Okay. And if you recall, um, Councillor Trembetta did bring that up, and we, we sort of talked about looking at possibilities, so... All right, well, you've heard the resolution, and we have a mover and a seconder. Mayor Billsma, Councillor Riley, all those in favor? And that motion carries. Okay. So item P16-20, Director of Planning and Building again, Mr. Brian Treble, re-report number PD-028-20. This is an information report about trail linkage, uh, Station Street to Dufferin Street. And the recommendation is that report PD-028-20 regarding information report trail linkage Station Street to Dufferin Street dated February 10th, 2020 be received for information purposes. So I still would like a mover, please. Councillor Rayner, Mayor Seconder, Mayor Bilsma. All right. And do you want to speak first to this, Mr. Treble? Um, through you, Madam Chair, only to say that I, I had received the request by committee uh, several months ago, but I, I kind of had to wait until we had our consultant uh, completing his review on College Street to know that 
Um, there was agreement generally on, on a, a flow connection to, to get us uh, somewhere good. I think generally I can say with, with confidence that from around the train station on Station Street, uh, we can get linkages into, into uh, the Mars development and vice versa. The piece that's not quite as clear yet and, and, and will take staff and better weather to be able to figure out exactly how we get from, I think it's called Dennis Drive, through to Dufferin. There is definitely a way to do it on paper, but I'm not convinced it's quite as good when I get to the ground. So I have to check that out in the spring. Okay. But ideally, we, I remember when I first came on council asking about that linkage to get through so that people were not always having to come out of Mars and Rosemont onto the main street and then you know down through town, but, but looking at another nicer way for them to make their way over to the community center. So that's good to know. Yes. Mayor Bilsma. So I just wanted to make um, uh, one comment and then one, one request. Uh, the comment is this, uh, I love this. And the part that really excites me um, is the, uh, the one portion there uh, by the train station uh, where I've taken a bit of a personal interest in, uh, in, in helping the uh, historical society and, and I, I think that um, our very beautifully restored train station is a little bit underutilized in terms of walkable, walkable traffic. Uh, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to that site, and um, I think that this is a key part. If we can get that um, that de that part of the trail, quote unquote, uh, developed in a, um, in a very well thought out way, um, could be quite advantageous to the. Um, uh, it, it could be a destination. Um, of, of walkability. That's the first thing. So I, I really like. I'm really excited about that. And the request is this: um, that we um, just continue to um, uh, try to find a, uh, a connection uh, to that little parkette in the Mars development uh, to the uh, train station along the old train line. Uh, so a little bit of that arc. If there was a way we could sneak uh, something along that, I think it's Galaxy Pallets, and then there's a bit of a, a vacant lot. Um, it's kind of at the end of uh, Brock Street there, and, and kind of comes in, and, and just on, on the site map, look like it's all part of the Galaxy Pallet uh, uh, ownership. Uh, I don't see any lines that separate it, but uh, some way that we could find a connectivity in there, I think that would be even um, um, a finer uh, connection. But again, appreciate the work done. Um, but if I'm going to ask and put on my wish list, um, that would be a, a, a wonderful, I think, a, a c connection. So, thanks. So good work, but keep it top of mind. I think that's the, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the message. There's another stakeholder. Absolutely, yes. absolutely. Is there anyone else who wants to make a comment or on that? Okay. <coughs> so we have a resolution and a mover and a seconder. Councillor Rayner and Mayor Bilsma. All those in favor? Okay, and that motion carries. Okay, moving on then to item P17-20, Planner 1, Alexa Cooper and Director of Planning and Building, Brian Treble. Re-report number PD-027-20, Recommendation Report, Zoning Bylaw Amendment, Temporary Use Bylaw, Fred and Beck Devine, Agent, Upper Canada Consulting. And this is a longer, so bear with me. The recommendation is one, that report PD-027-20 regarding zoning bylaw amendment, temporary use bylaw, Fred and Beth Devine, agent of Canada Consulting, dated February 10, 2020, be received. And two, that section 34, subsection 17 of the Planning Act apply, and that no further public meeting is required. And three, that an application for temporary zoning bylaw amendment 1601-018-19 submitted by Upper Canada Consultants on behalf of Fred Rook Devine and a corresponding temporary use bylaw for not more than two years be approved and passed and that staff be authorized to circulate the notice of decision for the temporary use zoning bylaw amendment with the corresponding 20-day appeal period and five, that the applicant enters into a temporary use agreement with the township prior to the bylaw being signed to collect securities for the cleanup of the site should the business not be removed once the temporary use bylaw expires. So I need someone to move that please. Mayor Bilsma, and second, Councillor Jonker. Mr. Treble, did you want to speak to that first, or? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, I, I probably should in this case, uh, okay. just to sort of enlighten uh, Council on some of the work that staff have done on this file. Um, 
There is an existing business in operation on the former Green Line property on South Grimsby uh, 8, I guess that would be. Um, and going back in time, it was understood that the relocation of the business that was on this farm parcel to the east of Bismarck would, would basically in its entirety happen to this new commercial enterprise. Um, unfortunately, the scale and size was such that it hasn't all been able to fit. Um, staff worked with the applicants to uh, make a new site plan for the business property and over the next few years you're going to see uh, a new building on the uh, commercial property, the old Green Line property take shape of, uh, on that property. And that, as I understand it, along with a lot addition that is proposed, will effectively get all of the business use off of the farm parcel. So from a business point of view, it's beneficial to work with that business to help keep it and support it and, and sustain it. But at the same time, we have uh, the encroachment of a non-agricultural use onto agricultural property, and it is in the bylaw world that we're trying to deal with it over on the farm parcel. Policy would say that temporary use is okay as long as the use is something appropriate for the area. This is not. Um, so I had to do a bit of work with uh, the regional staff to get onto the same page of being able to use the temporary use process as a way to um, help this transition along. And uh, effectively what we've been able to do is with the, the proposal of the two-year temporary, uh, along with a, a draft of an agreement and some securities, we will get a compliant situation at the end of this process. And, and with that, the region were on board to support us uh, in principle. So, Madam Chair, this is a somewhat unique circumstance trying to work with existing business and, and get them to uh, a point of compliance and two years hence, that's the plan. Okay. Thank you. Are there any further questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, then you've heard the resolution. I'm not going to read it again. We have a mover and a seconder. All those in favor? And that motion carries. Okay. Item P18-20, Director of Planning and Building, Brian Treble, we report number PD-026-20. It's a recommendation report changing the name of Silver Street, Smithville, between Rock Street and Town Line Road to Sterling Street. Recommendation one, that report PD-026-20. Regarding recommendation report changing the name of Silver Street Smithville between Rock Street and Town Line Road to Sterling Street, dated February 10, 2020, be received, and two, that the committee and council commit to naming Sterling Street such that staff may order sign blades and notify property owners, and three, that a bylaw be passed to name the street identified in Schedule A, Sterling Street, but that such bylaw not take effect until sign blades have been installed, and four, that staff notify all residents and agencies affected by this bylaw of council's decision and the timeline of implementation. Further, that costs should, should, should cost be incurred by the public as a result of this change, that costs with receipts to a maximum of $100 may be submitted to the township and will be charged to the 911 PERS capital account. And five, that all other street names as submitted through this report be forwarded to the Heritage Committee for future consideration. So I need a mover for that, please. Councillor Jonker and a seconder, Councillor Riley. Are there any questions or comments? Okay. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay. And 10.7 on your agenda is item P19-20, Municipal Bylaw Enforcement Officer Tiana Dominic and Director of Planning and Building Brian Treble. Re report number PD 031 20. It's an information report, the draft of a new sign bylaw. The recommendation is one that report PD 031 20 regarding information report draft of a new sign bylaw dated February 10th, 2020, be received for information purposes at this time. So, again, a mover, please. Mayor Bilsma and a seconder, Councillor Riley. Do you want to be on again, Mr. Trevor? <laughs> Would you like to give explanation to this before questions? Certainly. Um, the 
new zoning bylaw that was put in place in 2017 uh, was approved with an understanding that a couple of new bylaws would have to be forthcoming in order to implement pieces that historically were under zoning but it really wasn't the right place for them. Sign bylaw is one of those. So given the size though of the, of the bylaw as proposed, um, staff felt it was appropriate to sort of introduce it in an information format, give you some time to read it and digest it, um, and then I will have Tiana come to one of the future meetings so that we can answer in a fulsome way some of the questions and concerns committee may have. Um, but we'd encourage you to read the report and the bylaw, and if there are any concerns that jump to mind, let us know. I have reached out to some members of the community and I've asked them to uh, take a look at it and provide some input as well. Good. And I'm hoping with that we can maybe, you know, have a little bit smoother uh, implementation process than you might otherwise have with a, with a new bylaw. So. Okay, well it is very lengthy, so I appreciate the time to have a look at it and to digest it. I'm sure the members of committee do as well. Are there any questions right now for Mr. Treble? So everybody has homework, right? <laughs> okay, so that will come forward at another meeting. In the meantime, uh, you've heard the resolution. The recommendation is just to accept this for information purposes. So all those in favor? Okay. Okay, under other business, um, item P20-20, members of committee, other business matters of information nature. So I will start. Councillor Rayner, do you have anything you wish to say? Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. I really don't have um, too much to say other than I just want to acknowledge that for some of those who may not know, uh, today's the uh, last day our reporter from uh, uh, Niagara this oh, week, Beth, Beth. Uh, is going to be in our, um, our chambers. She's moving on uh, to another career. And uh, we just want to wish you the best. Uh, thank you for all the, the coverage you provided our community. <laughs> and uh, I just thought it was worth noting. So thank you. Well, I would agree. I think that we've had very fair representation. So thank you, Beth. Wish you well. I'm um, going across. Mayor Billsma, anything? Councilor Jonker? No. Yep. Mm -hmm. Madam CAO? No, thank you. No, thank you. Okay. Um, I just have a brief heads up um, on uh, we had an age friendly meeting on Friday, and once again this year we are in the works of um, planning another seniors forum, and the date is June the 5th. And so if you recall, I told you lots and lots last year about the age-friendly advisory committees forum. We had many representations, about 50 different groups who represented um, either opportunities for our older population to get involved in things in the committee or supports or services available to them. And so we will be doing that again with an expanded version this year. So stay tuned, but save the date, June 5th. Right. So at that point then, unless someone has an item of new business, and I'm not aware of any. Okay, then that closes the meeting for tonight, and we will be moving into confidential matters. So we have item P21-20, Deputy Clerk Elsa Corey, uh, re-committee appointment, applicable closed session exemptions, personal matters about an identifiable individual, including municipal 